Okay, I'm excited to welcome Liam Nash today, who's going to present his Ento live streams to spiders, how aquatic insects inter interconnect our ecosystems. So Liam has literally just finished his PhD, he's still waiting to get the go ahead to put the those important DR letters in front of his name. But he's going to talk to us about the research that he's been doing and what will hopefully be getting published in the very near future. So Liam, over to you. Uh, hi, Kieran. Uh, thanks for the introduction. And uh, yeah, thanks for putting on this great series of talks. And um, yeah, thanks to uh, everyone for attending uh, today or if you're catching up later, hello. Um, yeah, so this is my talk. It's called Streams to Spiders. And I hope that by the end of it, I'll impress on you how aquatic insects actually interconnect our entire world. Um, so uh, first introduction, my name is Liam Nash. Uh, as Kieran said, I'm currently in the nether zone between um, having handed in my PhD thesis, but not having defended it yet. So not quite a doctor, but almost there. Um, but I've been doing this for like around the last four years, primarily at Queen Mary University of London, um, funded by NERC as part of the London NERC DTP. Uh, and I also have collaborators at the University of Campinas uh, in Brazil and the Zoological Society of London here in, here in, here in London. Um, and yeah, there's the title of my thesis, and a lot of what I'll be discussing today uh, is kind of uh, stuff from that or the sort of general subject area. Um, and even though prior to my PhD, I was, I was more of a freshwater ecologist, I spent most of my time kind of collecting invertebrates in streams with nets. But for my actual PhD, I ended up doing uh, most of my field work on land. And that's sort of how I ended up uh, here in this picture, looking slightly worse for wear in the Amazonian jungle up a tree. Um, and the reason why I uh, ended up doing most of my field work on land is because um, aquatic and terrestrial environments don't exist in isolation. Uh, that is, um, water and land habitats are in fact tightly ecologically interconnected. Um, so, for example, uh, forests, they provision uh, fresh waters with a lot of resources. So, for example, leaf litter gets washed off in big, um, large quantities and other detritus it gets broken down and fuels um, a whole load of, um, of the diets of a load, a load of different aquatic organisms, including many insects. Um, but this isn't a one directional um, pathway. And the fresh waters actually give a lot of resources back onto land. Uh, this can happen through flooding, for example, where the water breaks its bank and deposits nutrients all over the surrounding area. Um, but actually, fresh waters export um, resources back onto land all the time. Uh, and this, this happens through uh, the movement of animals. Uh, for example, animals which have complex life cycles. So things like amphibians, like frogs and salamanders, um, but most importantly, and the most the largest group that do this are, are of course insects. Um, so yeah, the emerging aquatic insects, which are the main focus of my talk today, um, and these are insects with complex cross ecosystem life cycles, uh, and they transition from a water living juvenile to a land living, often flying adult. So I think everyone here today probably is a, has has at one time marveled at the um, metamorphosis of a caterpillar to a butterfly. But um, uh, yeah, I guess I invite you to think about everyone's other favorite insect, which is of course the mosquito. Um, so this is, these are juvenile mosquitoes uh, and they are, um, they are free swimming. Um, they have a free swimming larval stage uh, in which they undergo most of their development uh, in water uh, developing on aquatic resources and subject to aquatic processes. Um, but then like the caterpillar, they also undergo metamorphosis and become a pupa. Um, and then when they, um, when they uh, hatch out of this pupa, they actually transition from through the literal water surface uh, to become a flying uh, terrestrial adult in about as a different environment as you can possibly imagine, which is from being surrounded by water uh, to being surrounded by air. And uh, it's in this, this part of their life cycle, which is often uh, much, much shorter than the, the aquatic larval stage, uh, that they un undergo reproduction, find a mate, disperse, uh, and lay their eggs back into water to complete this quite remarkable life cycle. 
Um, but despite um, despite the apparent uh, complexity of this, uh, it's actually uh, extremely widespread. And emerging aquatic insects are highly diverse. They comprise around 60% of all freshwater species. Um, and perhaps can be most um, symbolized by the mayfly, which is the most probably well-known um, group of insects that do this. Uh, and they really, yeah, they symbolize the short-lived adult phase um, in their, the name of their, in, the, in their um, group name, the Ephemeroptera. But we also have the stoneflies um, and the caddisflies, which are also typical emerging aquatic insects. Uh, and of course, the Odonata, which includes uh, dragonflies and damselflies. Um, this one here is a particular favorite of mine. It's the Dobson fly, which is in the group Megaloptera. Um, and all five of these groups have almost exclusively aquatic larvae and all have this cross ecosystem life cycle. Um, but let's not forget the uh, true flies, the Diptera. Um, and even though these have True flies have a whole range of different uh, life cycle strategies, but many key aquatic insect groups um, are flies, uh, including this one illustrated here, which is um, a non-biting midge or a chironomid. And the chironomids also um, really exemplify how um, aquatic, emerging aquatic insects, not just diverse, but also widespread, because chironomids can be found in pretty much any freshwater environment that uh, you can imagine. Um, uh, on every single continent, including uh, Antarctica. So this is the Antarctic midge, which holds the title as the um, largest non-marine animal on the entire uh, Antarctic continent, um, which is testament to the, the yeah, sort of cosmopolitan distribution of these insects. Um, but there are other flies as well, for example, some hoverflies, um, and of course the mosquito, but also other biting flies, such as black flies, and a number of different uh, other fly families. Um, but this cross ecosystem life cycle is also found in beetles, true bugs, uh, lacewings, scorpion flies, uh, even some moths and parasitoid wasps, which uh, lay their, lay their um, eggs inside uh, the aquatic larval stage of some of these insects. Um, and then hatch out into the terrestrial environment via their bodies, which is pretty cool. Um, but not only are they diverse and cosmopolitan, but they can also be extremely abundant. And this is actually something that people most associate with aquatic insects is that they can emerge sometimes in these absolutely, in these mass emergence events, um, such as done by mayflies. Um, yeah, so they can be such big swarms that they cope it can become a public nuisance, coat your car, for example. Um, but it's not just um, mayflies that do this. This is a video of, uh, if, it, if it's playing correctly, uh, this is not a video of a dust cloud, but this is a video of a swarm of potentially billions of midges, uh, which have emerged together to form a sort of midge-nado uh, taken from Central America, I think. And at times, these swarms can be so big that they can, they're, detectable using weather radar, such as this image from North America, uh, which is of a mayfly swarm. And uh, yeah, in other parts of the world, people take advantage of these large numbers. And in areas surrounding the African Great Lakes, uh, they make a sort of protein-rich patty called a kunga cake out of the bodies of uh, thousands of these emerging midges. Um, but why do this? Why merge together in one big swarm? Well. Uh, obviously, there's survival in numbers from predators. Um, you maximize your mating opportunities. Um, and it also ensures that the, this very critical, but often very short-lived uh, life cycle stage uh, is aligned with optimal conditions to give the best chances for these insects to continue uh, their next generation. Um, and what this means is that um, for many of us, aquatic insect emergence is an explicitly seasonal event. Um, so if you're uh, watching this from the UK, you might associate um, a scene like this, uh, sort of midges dancing in the evening sun over a pond, uh, or a scene like this, less nice, being eaten alive by midges in Scotland. Um, but you will, you will likely associate these things as being explicitly something that occurs in either spring or summer. Um, 
which makes uh, aquatic insect emergence a major phenological event. And what I mean by that is uh, phenology is the, the word that describes the, the science of seasonal cycles in nature, when things happen in nature. Um, and it's sort of maybe best uh, sort of demonstrated by an image like this, which is sort of a tree going through uh, spring flowering, summer growth and autumn uh, leaf form. But um, despite these mass emergence events, we understand very little about freshwater phenology. Um, it's highly understudied compared to other things like the tree going through flowering or when the leaves fall in autumn or when birds migrate or lay eggs, for example. Um, but this is important because uh, when things are happening um, in nature is being extremely disrupted by uh, current and future climate change. But to understand how this will affect um, aquatic insect emergence, we need to understand better um, what drives uh, emergence. So there are a whole diversity of different triggers of emergence, um, which give rise to a diversity of emergence patterns. So most, um, probably most important is temperature change. Uh, for example, this a uh, study from 2006 showed that uh, I think these are burrowing mayflies, the emergence really kicks off after a critical uh, temperature threshold is reached. Um, but temperature is not the only seasonal change that might happen, also um, changes in uh, rainfall. Uh, so this is an example from an, a stream in the Andes, which shows quite nicely how, uh, again, I think it was mayflies um, uh, reduced their emergence when during periods of high river flow. And this can also be seasonal. But in other cases, it's not always linked to climate seasonal change. Um, this, is an, this here is an example from an old study from, uh, I think, one of the African um, Great Lakes. And it showed that uh, midge emergence was linked very closely to cycles of the moon, uh, was highest in, um, just after new moon. Um, but not all emergence is forms these kind of peaked rhythmic or seasonal distributions. And some of it can be apparently continuous or sporadic or erratic and not linked to any um, particular or obvious environmental drivers. Um, this uh, final figure here is from a tropical ecosystem. Um, so how do we make sense of this diversity? Uh, and are there any kind of systematic um, does the, do, the, do these patterns vary in a sort of systematic way around the planet? Uh, well, this is actually something that's been um, thought about for a while now. Um, and hypotheses on global patterns of emergence date back almost 60 years. Uh, this is a picture from a guy called Philip Corbett. He wrote a paper in 1964, which is uh, already starting to discuss some of these ideas. Um, there's a picture of him. He looks like a proper old school ecologist. Um, and his, um, the contents of this paper can be sort of best illustrated by this image here, which is from a textbook in 1995 by these three guys, Armitage, Pinder and Cranston. Um, and I think this illustrates quite nicely how um, it's hypothesized that emergence patterns have a kind of, um, they follow a global pattern from the high north, the high, the poles um, to the equator, where emergence that's um, towards the Arctic uh, is very peaked and emergence happens in these mass emergence events. And as you go further south towards the, to the equator, you, it sort of, um, it becomes lower and longer uh, until you get to the tropics where it starts to become decoupled from any kind of seasonal change and starts to cycle with something else, in this case, the moon. Um, but uh, while these ideas are largely assumed um, and they remained uh, mostly hypothetical. So for the first uh, chapter of my PhD, we wanted to kind of find some quantitative support for some of these ideas and also determine any geographical climatic drivers of these patterns. Um, so we conducted, to do this, we conducted a meta-analysis, which is uh, now published in um, Global Ecology and Biogeography. Um, and Essentially, this meant that we trawled through all of the published literature on aquatic insect emergence that we could find. Uh, in the end, after filtering, we got 86 studies, and these spanned seven decades of people going out and collecting aquatic insects as they emerge. Um, 
It covered 163 sites, uh, which you can see here in this map, um, across 31 countries. So we're quite happy with our spread of sites, but you can clearly see that there's a strong bias towards uh, North America and Europe um, with large gaps, especially in uh, Africa and Asia. So uh, throughout these studies, the most commonly used methods to count emerging insects uh, or sample emerging insects are emergence traps, which are sort of floating, often pyramidal nets, which essentially catch the insects at the moment that they leave the water. Um, in other cases, you can count um, the shed skins of already emerged insects, typically done for uh, dragonflies, which have large shed skins, easily identifiable. Um, other cases, you can use light trapping, particularly good for catching nocturnal emergence, um, and also sort of good old fashioned sweep netting of vegetation around water bodies. Um, and then the most commonly studied groups uh, were uh, flies, followed by um, caddisflies, mayflies, stoneflies, and dragonflies, these sort of typical aquatic insect groups. And what were we actually extracting and, and comparing in the, from all these studies were seasonal emergence curves, which are essentially um, uh, what is being illustrated here uh, by that old textbook illustration. Um, and indeed, some of the data we extracted actually matches what's um, illustrated there quite nicely. So on the right here are three sort of cherry picked examples where you can see uh, this tropical curve from Puerto Rico is sort of um, fluctuating a bit randomly. Um, then in Alabama, you have it's a it's a there's a bit more seasonal variation. You see a bit of a peak. Uh, and then in Canada, even further north, um, you have a very strong peak distribution. Uh, but these are three cherry picked examples. So if we actually put them all together, they look a bit like this, um, which is testament to the diversity of emergence patterns over in different locations, um, but difficult to interpret. So um, to interpret it, we pam parameterized each one of these lines um, and then compared them against each other. And then we could model them against geographical and climate variables to determine uh, any global patterns. Um, so each one of these lines is represented by a point on this graph, and we can see quite a strong positive relationship between uh, latitude going from the equator to the poles uh, and the degree of seasonality going from a more um, aseasonal distribution of emergence to one of those classic peaked uh, emergence distributions. So we take our three examples from earlier. Um, got Puerto Rico uh, on the lower right and the bottom left. Um, and then you've got Alabama sort of form, falls in the middle and then Canada falls up towards the top left. Um, so essentially we found kind of strong quantitative support for Corbett's old hypothesis from the 60s, um, which is that emergence, the pattern of emergence does shift along a, a latitudinal gradient. And, this, and, and our, our further climate modeling showed this was primarily driven by the temperature of the climate. So what's actually happening is essentially uh, in the warm tropics where there's relatively little seasonal variation, insects can emerge throughout the year. There's nothing stopping them doing that. Uh, they have small asynchronous monthly fluctuations based on um, a whole suite of different other environmental variables. Um, but then as you increase in latitude in Alabama, conditions are still good. You can still grow and um, reproduce throughout the whole year. Um, but there is more seasonal variation. So emergence starts to become limited to um, the point when conditions are most optimal. Um, and then as you go even further north, actually winter conditions are so harsh that you can't emerge uh, or even grow much during these periods. So uh, emergence starts to be constrained to a, a very small time period of creating these large peaks. So uh, why is this all important? Well, um, aside from sort of supporting an old bearded ecologist's uh, research from the 60s. Um, as I said, changing phenology is one of the most significant ecological responses to climate change. So when things are happening uh, in, 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 the, in the year are being disrupted by changing uh, weather conditions and, and climate. So for emerging aquatic insects, it's essentially the warmer, less seasonal climates that we're increasingly predicted um, would result in a shift from these sort of, from a sort of short, sharp seasonal peak 
uh, to a longer sort of flatter peak and potentially to a seasonal fluctuations at latitudes that would have never been previously seen at. And while this is undoubtedly going to affect the aquatic insects themselves, um, it will have wider impacts on other species which are seasonally reliant on them. And that's because aquatic insects, as I said, are, are, they're, they're diverse, they're widespread, they're abundant, but they're also super important. So <clears throat> some of them are predators like this dragonfly here. Um, and dragonflies kind of demonstrate quite nicely how through their complex uh, life cycles, um, aquatic insects can link processes happening in water with those on land. Um, so this study by Knight in 2005 showed how fish can actually affect um, pollination of plants on land. And that this happens by via um, emerging aquatic insect emergence, specifically that of dragonflies. So the fish ate dragonfly larvae in water, reduces the emergence of dragonflies above the water, then the, the dragonflies eat fewer bees, and then that allows uh, more bees to uh, pollinate the surrounding flowers, which boosts plant growth. Um, so sort of demonstrating uh, how they can, how they kind of, through a series of, uh, series of separate ecological interactions, link to completely different ecosystems. Um, but of course, dragonflies aren't just predators of bees. Um, they're, they're generalist predators of a whole range of flying insects, including many um, pest species. And of course, emerging aquatic insects actually uh, include many pollinators as well. So of course, um, the hoverflies, not all hoverflies, but some hoverflies of aquatic larvae. Um, little known is that many mosquitoes uh, also contribute to pollination. Uh, and without um, sort of similar insects to these, you wouldn't have uh, chocolate because this picture on the right here is a cocoa flower. Uh, and that tiny little midge that you can see there uh, is a cocoa midge, uh, which is closely related to the midges that uh, bite us. But um, not all emerging aquatic insects are uh, pollinators or, or predators, but some of them are less beneficial. Um, yeah, so. Um, emerging aquatic insects or insects with this life cycle include some of the most serious um, insect vectors in human disease. Uh, you've got the yeah, Aedes and Anopheles mosquitoes, which transmit malaria and yellow fever. Um, black flies here in the middle, which um, can transmit river blindness. Uh, and also the biting midge, which we're aware of here is in the UK is mostly being an annoyance, but in other parts of the world can also spread disease. Um, but even the mayfly, which um, many of them actually lack developed mouth parts at all as adults because their short-lived adult stage is uh, just devoted to reproduction and not much else. Um, what the mayfly shares with the rest of these insects in terms of functionality is that they are all uh, important prey. Um, for a whole variety of uh, predators on land. So um, these include many types of birds, bats, spiders, beetles, lizards, uh, basically you name it, anything that likes to eat insects will probably like to eat aquatic insects. And that's because um, they're often highly nutritious, particularly, um, particularly in highly unsaturated fatty acids. Um, they're also uh, seasonally abundant. Uh, as I've as I've shown, uh, they can often be seasonally available in very uh, high numbers, um, and often they're particularly easy to catch because, um, unlike a terrestrial adult insect, which might be sort of sat there for ages um, trying to survive, these guys as adults are primarily uh, interested in reproducing in a short period of time. So they're investing quite little in anti-predator defenses um, and long-term survival. And because of these things, um, they can, they can, they've been repeatedly shown to boost the health and immune function, breeding success of the predators which eat them. Um, so for example, this is a study by Twining in 2018, uh, where uh, they show that these birds here, they're tree swallows in North America, uh, closely time their um, time when they rear their young with the peak of aquatic insect emergence. And, Obviously, this means that any disruption to when this peak happens because of 
changing um, seasonality uh, will have an impact on these birds. But by boosting health, immune function, breeding success, these insects often um, increase the populations of predators that eat them. Uh, here's another study by Ricald in 2016 uh, from Brazil, where they covered these streams, uh, covered streams in a sort of greenhouse in enclosure, preventing emergence. And they noticed a massive drop in the, in the predators in the surrounding area. I think this study was looking at spiders. Um, and then by modifying predators, uh, emerging aquatic insects can have cascading effects um, throughout the entire terrestrial ecosystem. So it, it is, to illustrate this nicely is this, uh, this paper by Henschel in 2001, where they showed that these spiders here, these um, long-jawed orb weaving spiders, which are specialists, uh, often specialize in feeding on aquatic insects, were boosted in population size, which then um, had a consequence on the old, they then predated more on other insects in the, in the area, including uh, leafhoppers. Uh, that then reduced the population of leafhoppers, which then uh, freed their, the plants they were feeding on, I think it was nettles in this case, from herbivory, which then allowed them to grow even bigger. So uh, because of these, because of these wider effects, um, emerging aquatic insects, this kind of complex life cycle means that fresh waters can actually have impacts uh, that extend beyond the uh, physical border between water and land. Uh, so this is a paper in 2014 by Muehlbauer where they kind of asked how wide is a stream really from a biological point of view um, and they sort of tracked, they looked at lots of studies and tracked these insects uh, in land and found that the biological stream signature as they called it uh, extends well inland, and this is through the movement of these insects. Um, and they 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 found that the majority of these insect, insects don't go that far and uh, are deposited within the first few meters of the of the river's edge. Um, I mean, this makes sense. They they want to oviposit back into the fresh into fresh water to complete their life cycles, so they don't typically want to go that far away from it. But some of them do, and some of them have been found uh, times hundreds of meters away from any kind of aquatic source. So this kind of leads me on to my uh, streams to spiders part of my PhD, um, where we wanted to expand on this and look at how far from water are aquatic insects actually being consumed by predators um, and what kind of impact are they having on the predators and on the environment around them. Um, and how far from water does this impact extend? Um, uh, for example, a mayfly may fly for 100 meters or so, but when it lands, is it actually being eaten? Is it actually having an effect? Um, and then based on the biases in where aquatic insect uh, research had been carried out historically identified in our um, meta-analysis was we wanted to compare this between tropical and temperate environments. So uh, to do that, we um, compared a bunch of sites in Brazil, our tropical sites, with a bunch of sites in the UK, our temperate sites. And each one of these sites, um, we sampled multiple streams within the same catchment. And at each one of these streams, we took a sort of 150 meter transect going from the stream into uh, an area of continuous forest. Um, so here's some pictures of two of the transect. One on, on, the, on the left here is one going from an Amazonian stream. Uh, and on the right is one being deployed in Wales. Um, and then along each one of these transects, we sampled the invertebrates at five points, uh, going from water to 150 meters uh, inland. And you can see here from these pictures, these are very different types of forests. You've got dense uh, Amazonian and Atlantic rainforest in Brazil to kind of more open um, coniferous and deciduous woodland in uh, the UK. Um, to then collect our invertebrates, we sort of used a high-tech uh, ecological sampling technique of uh, bagging vegetation uh, in bin bags and wrapping it up with tape. Um, here's here's um, some of my team looking chuffed with their uh, haul of vegetation. Um, and then we would take that uh, back to a lab or to a sorting area and go through it in a systematic way and collect every single uh, invertebrate that's living on this uh, vegetation. 
So we have a, an idea of the entire um, forest invertebrate community. So all in all, um, we, we ended up carting 280 kilograms of vegetation out of um, different forests. It ended up being a lot more than, we, than I thought. Um, and on this vegetation, we found over 11,000 uh, invertebrates uh, from across 475 different communities. And uh, yeah, invertebrates living up to their, um, their, to their diversity. We found 39 major invertebrate groups uh, living on the vegetation including 20 insect orders and five arachnid orders. And um, importantly, 40% or around 40% of all of the individuals we, we captured were uh, spiders, which are key interceptors of aquatic insects. So how much aquatic insect prey were these spiders actually eating? Well, while I was being eaten by the aquatic insect prey, um, this is me after about two days uh, in the jungle, not looking too happy. Um, but yeah, we we used um, um, this method to work out the, we used stabilized tip analysis to work out what the spiders were actually eating. Um, and basically to run through it quickly, you use a mass spectrometer to analyze the elemental composition of the spiders and then use a fat, so some sort of fancy maths to compare that with um, water and land signatures. And you can sort of work out based on um, their tissues, what they're eating. Um, and yeah, so the, the preliminary results from this, uh, as Kira was saying, this is still just in my PhD and it's not, not published yet. Um, but preliminarily we found that tropical spiders um, were consuming 27% uh, more aquatic insects than in the UK. Um, uh, and in both regions, this was obviously highest near water, which makes sense, that's where the insects are coming from. And it leveled off between 30 and 60 meters, but crucially, it didn't reach zero even by 150 meters, which kind of shows that these predators, these spiders are still um, uh, get capturing these insects at quite a distance from water. So uh, yeah, in the, to summarize our results, which are still uh, in review, um, linked to consuming this higher uh, amount of aquatic insect prey. Uh, tropical spider communities, um, they had broader diets. They were consuming this alongside other uh, forms of, of insects. Um, they were more populous. They had higher populations near water. Um, and they had unique, um, a unique species composition near water where they're incorporating most of these insects into their diet. Um, and then there was also a potential knock-on effect because there was um, the, the, the rest of the terrestrial community was lower near water, uh, particularly for herbivores, um, which are their, the alternative prey for these spiders. So what this kind of means and what we, what we interpret from this is that the influence of aquatic environments is extending beyond um, ecosystem boundaries. And this is happening via emerging aquatic insects. Um, we found most consistently that tropical spiders were both more reliant on and impacted by aquatic insect resources in their diet. And what this suggests is that tropical forests are more integrated um, with their adjacent aquatic ecosystems than in the UK. Um, and this could potentially make them more vulnerable from any anything that happens to the supply of this resource. So anything that happens to aquatic insects uh, could have a knock-on effect on these spiders. Um, so are emerging aquatic insects under threat? Well, freshwater biodiversity is in crisis. Um, this figure from WWF's Living Planet Report, the most recent one, uh, shows that by their uh, index, freshwater biodiversity has decreased by over 80%. And this was by far the worst environment, uh, the, the, the worst biome that they tested. Um, and at the same time, insects are undergoing complex global trends. Um, I'm sure none of you have missed headlines like this in response to insect declines, sort of the so-called insect apocalypse. Uh, obviously, this has been a lot of debate around this, and obviously now it's sort of deemed more complicated than originally thought. Um, but I still think it's it's well summarized by this paper in 2021, which is that insects are facing a death by a thousand cuts, which 
as to the complexity and sort of um, making any sweeping global statements, but they are undoubtedly threatened by um, a whole range of different um, human uh, stresses. But what about aquatic insects? Well, uh, importantly, the Living Planet report, uh, Living Planet Index does not include freshwater index, uh, freshwater insects in this, in their calculation. And despite them being over 60% of freshwater biodiversity, so this is quite a big emission. Um, and aquatic insects actually uh, added to some of the debate around um, the insect uh, apocalypse, uh, which I'll get into in a second. So there have been some clear examples of aquatic insect declines, so from Germany, uh, from the Netherlands, um, and even those um, mass mayfly emergencies from North America, which can be detected with, with wet weather radar, uh, have also undergone massive declines in the last few decades. And when you're measuring your uh, insects in terms of billions of individuals or kilotons of biomass, this is quite an extreme um, decline. But is it really that bad? Well, uh, this meta-analysis by Van Klink in 2020 um, found that when they analyzed as many long-term insect population data sets they could get their hands on, um, that well, they did find that on average terrestrial insects are declining, um, but they found that freshwater insects on average are actually doing um, well and increasing in population. And while there are a few, um, oh yeah, so that's them there in blue on the positive side of the trend uh, line. Um, and this, this result had a few criticisms uh, leveled at it, but one of them was the strong northern bias in where these data sets came from. And particularly, uh, as with, with my meta-analysis as well, um, although perhaps slightly worse even, uh, they only had about three data points from the tropics, which is the, the most biodiverse um, the most biodiverse and largest um, region on the planet. So this is quite an omission, um, although something that all meta-analyses um, struggle with. So, what happens if you um, look at the uh, look at the tropics and subtropics a little bit more closely? Um, well, this is a, uh, a picture of the Paraná River uh, in South America. Um, it's the second longest river in uh, South America, um, uh, and it also drains much of the central and southern part of the continent. So it's no, by no means an insignificant uh, water basin. Um, and I was lucky enough to um, contribute to an, a, a sort of relatively rare long-term um, data set of aquatic insect monitoring uh, from South America. Um, and what we found was, was worrying, which is uh, you know, across all insect groups um, that we observed pervasive declines. And this was linked to the widespread construction of dams across the network. Um, which then facilitated changes in water chemistry um, and uh, water chemistry and fish invasion, which reduced populations of these insects. So this kind of shows how perhaps by including more data sets uh, from the global south, you might have a slightly different picture of what's happening with aquatic insects from a global point of view. Similarly, with uh, climate change, um, this paper here from uh, North America from 2012 showed that actually with warming warming increased emergence because these insects take advantage of the warmer waters and then start to emerge in uh, larger numbers um, and with quicker development times um, but we wanted to know does is this still the case for tropical insects and well this study was carried out uh, in mesocosms these, these kind of experimental ponds as pictured here uh, these kind of facilities are quite rare across the tropics uh, so we actually used, ended up using this other really cool uh, model system, which is um, the tiny micro ecosystems held within uh, a tank bromeliad, which is a plant which holds a pool of water within its leaves. And within this pool of water is a whole range of different organisms, including many uh, emerging aquatic insects. Um, and like the Musicosm study, we uh, warmed them up to different temperatures experimentally, as you can see here, and wrapped them up in a uh, in, in an emergence trap so we could capture everything that was coming out of the water. And what we found was, uh, unlike in the temperate study, that 
uh, across all of our groups in terms of biomass and abundance or across most groups of emerging insects, uh, we observed um, quite sharp declines, uh, even with small degrees of warming. Um, and what we discuss in our paper, which is um, out in the Journal of Animal Ecology, is that um, um, warming more negatively impacted emergence in the tropics. And we think this is because even though tropical insects are um, adapted to higher temperatures on average, because of the lack of seasonal variation in the tropics, um, this means that they're not really adapted to, um, they're already living quite close to the kind of maximum temperature they can live to, that they can um, live in. Uh, so they're essentially more vulnerable to any kind of change uh, in temperature in their environment. And I hope by now I've sort of impressed on you that um, anything, anything that happens to emerging aquatic insects, uh, which essentially interconnect um, two different, quite, quite different environments, uh, can have knock-on effects for um, the organisms which are relying on them. And the first, the first group of organisms that are reliant on them are predators. Um, so um, various different examples listed here from studies which were either excluded or otherwise reduced aquatic insect emergence. And then you can see that repeatedly across different types of predators and different types of environments, so uh, spiders, finches, lizards in deserts and uh, lakes and tropical streams, all suffer declines when you remove these insects from the environment. Uh, and it's kind of illustrated quite nicely by this example from uh, Pate in 2011, where they looked at the impact of historical um, coal mining in the north of England. And you can see that in streams impacted by, by mining, um, they had fewer uh, larval insects inside the water. That then meant there was fewer emerging insects outside of the water. Um, which then uh, meant there were fewer predators of these insects, in this case spiders, uh, in the surrounding area. And um, in, this in that case, uh, pollution reduced predators by impacting the supply of this food source in the form of insects. But the insects can actually be a, for a uh, pathway uh, for pollution in their own right. And this is because uh, in aquatic environments, many pollutants are much more available. Um, and they, en they, they enter the bodies of these aquatic insects, which then transfer them into land food chains when they emerge and are eaten. So, for example, um, uh, spiders like this, uh, another long-jawed orb weaver, uh, have been found to contain um, extremely high concentrations of organic contaminants, such as PCBs, and this is because they're eating a lot of aquatic insects. Uh, similarly, uh, another study uh, looking at sort of similar spider species found that over 60 types of pharmaceuticals can be found in these spiders, uh, including antidepressants and opiates. Um, so maybe they're not having such a good, not having such a bad time themselves, but um, this is likely to have many negative effects on their populations. Um, it's not just spiders. Um, this study found that insectivorous birds, uh, which ate large amounts of aquatic insects had higher loads of heavy metals such as uh, mercury but there's other studies which have seen this happening with lead as well which are definitely not going to be good for these birds um, and more recently uh, microplastics have been found to be able to uh, that it's been found uh, in lab studies that microplastics are actually retained in the bodies of emerging insects uh, through metamorphosis from water onto land so this could provide a novel pathway for these uh, pollutants to re-enter the terrestrial environment uh, from where they originally came from. And thus, and while uh, this means I've sort of discussed how kind of bad things can propagate from water onto land via these insects, it also means that conservation measures which um, are applied to one ecosystem can have positive effects in the other. So for emerging aquatic insects and the species which rely on them, an integrated approach is required. Um, so, uh, for example, improving aquatic habitat can benefit terrestrial biodiversity. So in this study here, they found that uh, beavers, by um, creating more complexity in aquatic environments, boosted the, populate, boosted the amount of insect emergence, which then had a positive effect on bat populations, which were feeding on those insects. 
Um, similarly, uh, habitat, aquatic habitat creation can have positive effects on terrestrial biodiversity. So um, this is a picture from, this is a picture of a hoverfly lagoon, which is a citizen science project based here in the UK, which is trying to encourage um, people to um, set up aquatic, um, aquatic hoverfly habitat uh, in their gardens where the larvae can um, grow and then emerge as hoverflies, not just to benefit the hoverflies, but also to boost pollination um, in the surrounding uh, land area. But on the flip side, you can also manage the terrestrial habitat to then have positive effects in the aquatic habitat. So um, in this study here by Lewis Phillips in 2020, um, they describe ponds as being insect chimneys and demonstrate how uh, management of the surrounding area boosted um, aquatic insect emergence, which then had a, a cascading effect to increase this, the amount of birds in, around the ponds by, I think, 25 times. Um, and importantly, uh, it's important uh, because of the the importance of this kind of cross ecosystem life cycle of these insects that we protect the interface between land and water. And one of the ways that this is done is through uh, proper management of riparian buffer zones. Um, so these are uh, strips of um, land around, protected land around waterways. Um, and typically they're implemented to protect fresh water from uh, things like agricultural runoff, pesticides, et cetera. Um, but as you can see, um, they're often some of the only protected area in the environment. This is a picture I took from a plane in Brazil um, and uh, are increasingly recognized as sort of unique terrestrial uh, habitat in their own right. So uh, that brings me to the end of my talk. So I hope by now, um, I've kind of convinced you that the remarkable life cycles of these often overlooked insects um, can, can interconnect our dynamic world. And by understanding these insects, um, we can under appreciate that we cannot consider different habitats in isolation. Um, through the results that we've, through the different results found from the tropics and in temperate regions, um, this shows how we must close research gaps between the global north and global south. And I think by understanding the complex life cycle that these insects have, um, we can understand how anything we do to our environment can have unexpected and often cascading consequences, which uh, go beyond our immediate perspective. Um, and at the very least, I think, hope that you can now appreciate that next time you see a tiny midge bothering you, that it's also um, not just annoying you, but it can be a, a tasty snack for a whole variety of different uh, predators and that it in itself has a key role to play in our ecosystems. So yeah, thanks for listening. Um, and thanks to everyone who's helped me out, my supervisors um, and everyone who's helped me out in the field and the lab. And uh, yeah, any questions?